So hello everyone, this is session number five of MEG5. I'm Anand Krishnamurti from RC Coaching. We have been before, we've had MEG sessions before uh, last month. We had four sessions and uh, we discussed literary criticism, its beginnings and uh, its initial phases in Britain uh, during that four day phase. So in this particular phase that we are here again, so those who were there in the last class, if you remember, we were trying to, along with dealing with theory and criticism and stuff, we were also trying to uh, assess the historical timeline. And uh, I was trying to talk to you about the post-restoration period. I, I gave you a brief as to what happened uh, as a result of the civil wars, how Charles I was dethroned, how the Puritan rule under Sir Oliver Cromwell came into existence, which was later followed by his son, Richard Cromwell, and how uh, the son of Charles I came back and uh, ascended to the British throne in what was called as the Glorious Revolution, also called as Restoration. So ever since 1660 onwards, we call that period as the, in, in several names, one is restoration period, we use the word neoclassical age, we use the word age of satires, we also refer to that with the name of the writers like uh, age of Dryden, age of Pope, age of Johnson, age of Swift and so on and so forth. So we tried to discuss all this uh, when we were in the last session, if you remember. So today we'll just move on from there. The reason why I uh, attempted a historical overview was also because it is quite necessary to move on to the next theoretical part, that is Romanticism in literature. So before we move to Romanticism, what existed in the post-restoration period, as I've already told you, was called Neoclassicism or the Age of Satires. So there were two group of factional political parties, the Whigs and the Tories. So based on who's at power under the king, uh, they, 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 they assumed certain privileges and those who didn't get it started to be uh, offended and they started writing satires and there were you know, re replies and so on. So in such a venture, amidst such a process, it so happened that that period was marked by high class elitism and patronage or patronizing. By elitism, I'm not talking about a caste elitism that we are familiar with, but I'm talking about a literary elitism, which was existent even before that though. But the neoclassical period saw a surge of that elitist or geniusite uh, sort of a, an approach. During that time, not only poetry, writing in itself was a sophisticated affair. People had a belief that genius is for real or talent is inborn and only people with good flair of language and good inborn talent can become accomplished writers. Such a thought was there in the olden times as well, but even people like William Shakespeare who never went to, went to school was into writing. But during the neoclassical period, the language that these writers employed became very crucial. And it was also an era of patronizing. What is patronizing? There is an established writer, a well-known figure. Then there is a caucus that revolves around them. There are a few people, we call them hack writers in general. So people like hack writers who survive by revolving around this person like planets revolve around uh, son. So this person takes care of their daily expenditure, he tries to um, feed them, he tries to write four words or professors, he tries to put them in, he tries to put, put a word of mouth about these people and these people in turn try to, so that's, that's a sort of a give and take approach that existed. And of course, that's not something that's really appreciated. But we can see that trend among most of the popular people around. At, at, at this point of time, if you are mature enough, and if you look at our contemporary literary or film politics, you could see that that's how these award functions and all happen, or how somebody becomes an established director. 
they'll have few people whom they would be uh, encouraging to write reviews about their works and they would be writing as if this is the next great cult film director and gradually that person becomes established and that person uh, takes care of a lot of people and that's how it works. Uh, so that existed during the neoclassical period. Alexander Pope himself was one of these uh, major patrons of the times. But then he always appeared to be contemptuous of this patronizing system. I still remember this poem called Epistle to Dr. Arbut Moot. So there is this poem called Epistle to Dr. Arbut Moot, uh, wherein apparently the situation is such that Arbut Moot is the physician of the queen and Arbut Moot is sick. Maybe he's 70 plus years old and Arbut Moot is in his bed. And Alexander Pope as a good friend or a brother, uh, tries to. Oh, have I have I have I mentioned that before? Okay. So, as as a good brother, Pope writes a get well soon letter in the, in the, in the form of poetry to Arbut. But then, up until say 70, 80, 90 lines in that poem, there is not a mention of Arbut. Up until that point, Alexander Pope talks about his predicament. He begins by those lines, shut, shut the door, good John, fatigue thy said, tie up the knocker, say I'm sick, I'm dead, I'm not well. Yeah, this, could, this is uh, inter, you know, intertextual as well, you could uh, find the use in MAG1 in particular. So yeah, uh, so he says, shut, shut the door, good John, fatigue thy said, tie up the knocker, say I'm sick, I'm dead. And then he goes on to say that, because he is a celebrity, because he is quite a popular figure, he can't live a normal life. Because he is a writer, because he has this gift of gab, because he can write, he has to please all these people. He can't even go to church peacefully. Even when he rides in a boat, uh, people come in the water and say, uh, write a piece for me, write a preface for me, or be my patron, or produce a play for me. So I, I don't have any peace of mind whatsoever, is what Alexander Pope says. And uh, this uh, sort of a uh, dilemma is presented by Alexander Pope in Epistle. So he also says that I lisped in numbers, therefore the numbers came. Numbers in that poem means uh, poetry. So back then numbers also meant poem. So I was born with the gift of poetry and poetry came naturally to me and then he writes what sin dipped me in this ink right? as if what 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 sin did i do it comes naturally to me i can't control it and then i have to tolerate all these things but then pope was really 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 uh, I, i'm about to talk about romantic literary criticism Amateur. So before that, I'm just continuing from where we left in the last, in the previous class. So yeah, uh, so Alexander Pope uh, was one of those patronizing agents. There were quite a lot of patrons over there. So to keep it simple, neoclassical poetry was sophisticated. They used mock epic, for instance, as a genre. Uh, heroic couplet was popularized. And uh, it was highly sophisticated because it was satirical in nature, general. So after that, a lot of historical events also took place, especially in the year 1779, if I remember correct. No, sorry, 16, no, when is it? Yeah, sorry, 1789. Yes, 1789, we have this uh, French Revolution that took place and French Revolution paved way to a lot of changes because again it was a revolution that sought to overthrow monarchy. Queen Mary Antonita's statement uh, of disregarding the poor is quite famous. If you don't have bread, let them eat cake. So uh, French Revolution was a landmark event, uh, 1789. And uh, a lot of things happened between 89 and 98 in Britain as well. Especially a, liter a sort of a literary idealism crept into Britain. Quite a lot of poets in London were so excited by what happened in uh, French Revolution. 
A typical example is Percy Bysshe Shelley. Shelley was an idealist poet, and his idealism has its, uh, you know, connection with the French Revolution. That's why, uh, in his Ode to the West Wind, he ends the poem saying, "If winter comes, can spring be far behind?" So, uh, such idealism was fueled by the French Revolution that took place in 1789. So, talking about the romantic tradition that start that kick starts, the landmark year that we often associate with is 1798. What happens in 1798? 1798 is a landmark year with the publication of a book. Lyrical ballads. Yes, lyrical ballads. So, in the year 1798. the book lyrical ballads was brought out by william wordsworth and samuel taylor coleridge i'll come to that landmark book maybe a couple of minutes later let me briefly also discuss another phenomenon called transition poets maybe during your graduation days you may have heard of this term you may also be familiar with the name of these poets like thomas gray robert burns yeah so uh, again uh, the other guy so william blake also yeah william blake william blake yeah, i was just trying to remember yes yeah, so william blake thomas gray uh, robert burns are all given the tag transition poets so what does the word transition mean you may get a short note asking what do we mean by transition poets so the next 5 minutes could be highly useful for you just in case you find mk brams boy so who are transition poets or what are their attributes what are their features how are they distinct from neoclassical or romantic poets dryden neoclassical no, no, poets that yeah yeah i am asking about transition poets what are their attributes what are their features why do we call them i was talking about the uh, neoclassical poets sir yeah i understood and my question is regarding the transition poets i was trying to talk to you about transition poets i gave you three names robert burns william blake and thomas gray so how are they different from neoclassical or romantic poets what is what are the unique attributes that they possess It's okay. In case if you are not aware of that, or if you are finding it difficult, it's totally fine. I'll sum it up for you. More often than not, most of the learners that I interact with, yeah, okay, there are some answers in the chat box. Just give me a second. Maybe they change the so-called structure because they were a bit neoclassical in romanticism. It appeals more to the imagination. All right, fair enough. So uh, more often than not, when I interact with my learners regarding this particular concept, I, I. realize that most of the learners are not aware of or they don't quite think about the fact that there could be people with the same attributes across the ages but why do we call these particular pe- uh, poets as transition i'll come to that in a moment yes priti agrawal ji i can see your hands so, up i can only uh, i mean i i can predict because people were trying to i mean Uh, in new classical age we saw that how the elit- elitist or elevated language was being used and mm-hmm. some of the poets were uh, trying to break this uh, you know and try to make the poem more simpler so that every could uh, everyone could access to them so uh, so th- there was a transition period when people tried to write more li- uh, in a lucid fashion and it also came before romanticism i mean the period we, uh, which we call romantic period uh, so it i mean there's a shift it's not like a shift doesn't comes in one day it's a process uh, it's a long i mean so that is why i, I think yeah. good observations please good observations so the point i was trying to make is also the same but before making that point the the, the thing that i want you to think about or notice is that across every age across every century we have a transition from one group to the other even though all these tags are tentative and for convenience uh, we could see for instance there is metaphysical poetry 
and it is followed by a certain set of poetry. Then you could see John Milton writing a sort of a Puritan essence poetry. So, or later you would see Victorian, uh, after Romanticism, you would see a Victorian emergence through uh, Lord Alfred Tennyson and uh, William, uh, sorry, and uh, Robert Browning and uh, Matthew Arnold and so on. So it doesn't mean like right after Shelley or Keats, uh, Matthew Arnold started writing or Tennyson started writing. There would definitely be in-between poets. But then across the ages, we don't call any other in-between poets as transition poets. So why are we referring to these three or there are other transition poets as well, whom we don't really name as much. So why do we name these people as transition poets? Is something that you need to ponder about. So to keep it simple, as I have already established, neoclassical period was a period of sophisticated language and a recognition of talent and genius or an inborn essence to write poetry. What followed later was not the same. Romanticism from Wordsworth onwards, we'll discuss in another few minutes, was the exact opposite of this. In the sense that they tried to make poetry commonplace. They tried to make poetry popular. Wordsworth, for instance, wanted poetry to be read by the common people, the milkman, the uh, gardener, or anyone for that sake. So such a democratization is what romanticism aimed at. So this transition, like Prithiji said, rightly pointed out, cannot happen over, overnight. There's a process, it takes time. So the precursors of romanticism is what these romantic writers, sorry, these transition writers actually served as. Because they belong to the neoclassical or just post neoclassical period, they had certain essence or attributes of neoclassical writing or we could say a hangover of neoclassical writing. But because romanticism has not begun yet, we can't call them romantic writers. So because they fall in between these two, the one that is almost over, the other that is yet to begin. And because these people have attributes of what was over, and they have quite a lot of shades of what is to follow later. They are called as transition poets. Transition means a sort of a change. So a transition from one era to another, one genre to another. So such a transition was effected by these writers. And if a transition has to take place, and I say a transition, a radical transition has to take place, it requires quite a lot of courage and experimentation. You cannot initiate a random transformation just like that. So such a transformation is enabled by the readiness to experiment or the courage to experiment among these writers. For example, well, before giving an example, I could see AK Bhagat, your hands raised. Do you have a question? Bhagatji? No, I think that's my accident. Okay. So we have more learners coming in nonetheless. I can see 30 people right now. Which is good to see. Yes, Pratiji, do you have a question? Yes, sir. I was about to ask, like, so I was reading yesterday about Jane Austen and she also mm -hmm. belonged somewhere in the, I mean, in the um, beginning of the Romantic uh, age and uh, Wordsworth was well established by then. But then she didn't acknowledge him at all. And also she's uh, like, uh, she uh, is said to be uh, belong, uh, she is said to belong uh, in the 18th century. Why mm -hmm. so, sir? I didn't understand what exactly are you referring I mean, to? I uh, mean, she is placed in the 18th century novelist. Why is yeah. it so? Because she lived in the 18th century. She was born, uh, I mean, she had a very brief life. But from what I remember, her peak or her prime was between, let's say, 18, 18, 2 to 18, 10, 12, something like that. So that's why she's so called as. 
but sir it's mentioned that uh, she uh, when she wrote her first novel i don't remember the name but by then wordsworth was already established as a great poet but then also she didn't recognize him like as a poet and instead she followed two other poets i right now i cannot recall ah, that that's her personal choice no everybody will have their own you know uh, unique choice and set of preferences if we speak about a director you may be fond of a per- particular person and someone else may not be fond of that person that's natural right okay sir yeah people may have their own tastes and regarding jane austen she would have had her own pursuits which was differing from mr wordsworth and as i told you wordsworth's ventures were not always appreciated by everybody there were people who thought wordsworth to be uh, a villain of poet i come to that a little while later okay so let me just continue you know complete this transition poet stuff first and then we'll switch over to the um, the uh, romantic part So yeah, regarding transition poets, so these three poets, to say the least, uh, dared or showed the courage to experiment. William Blake is a classic example because William Blake, he not only wrote poetry, but he also started to carve and draw in his book. So it sort of became an installation. there is a depiction then there is there are a few lines later you could see a similar instance in pre raphaelite brotherhood for example there is a painting and with that they write a poem so something like that yes salman karim as i told you i am not the one who's letting people in so as long as the uh, rc kochin admin is there and they let people in uh, i think they will be able to join i'm not sure about that because generally they say they let people enter only in the first 10 15 minutes but i could see quite a lot of people joining later as well so maybe auto entry is enabled i'm not sure i am not able to connect to them i did try to talk to them when the session began at 5:39 but then they were not available so maybe they are in the queue and there is very little that i can help in this regard because as i told you uh, they function on their own and i have no connections they send me the link even i waited Till five thirty nine, just like the way you did. So maybe you can try writing a complaint mail to RC Kuchin. You could write RC Kuchin at gmail dot com. You could send them a complaint mail saying the classes are delayed every single day, and something has to be done. I I put in the word from my side, but I'm not sure what exactly is the problem from there. Right? Okay. So uh, talking about William Blake, for instance, William Blake used to carve and uh, paint, and along with that, he used to write and uh, you may be familiar with his poems tiger tiger burning bright yeah so there are two uh, transitions lamb and tiger uh, that comes along with william blake's poetry then regarding thomas gray there is this poem called elegy written in a country churchyard the title is misleading i i request you to read that but one transition poet again if you if, if, if i am just going with names and you are just forgetting them i'll type it for you as well william blake um thomas gray and last one just in case you are least familiar with i would like you to read us robert burns my love is like a red red rose it is a classical precursor to romanticism if you read my love is like a red red rose it is a very simple an amazing uh, poem that would appeal to you All right. So very quickly, let's switch over to the Romantic era. As we have mentioned, 1798, the publication of lyrical ballads kick-started the Romantic era. More often than not, the students of literature find that word to be misleading. Even though you are familiar with the word romance, which means a relationship between two people, love relationship between two people. that has nothing to do with the romanticism that we speak about in literature romanticism in literature or theory or poem has nothing to do with a relationship sort of a love it has a lot more to do with nature when we say romanticism it has a lot more to do with nature again up until then up until neo classicism Again, I can give another example of Dr. Samuel Johnson, 
who in his preface to Shakespeare calls Shakespeare universal because his characters are embodiments of nature. The nature that romanticists speak is actually in contrast to the nature that neoclassists including Dr. Johnson speak about. The nature that Dr. Johnson says is prevalent in Shakespearean characters is human nature. But the nature that romanticists emphasize is the nature that we are familiar with, the one that is around us, Prakriti. So with William Wordsworth and he had a friend by name Samuel Taylor Coleridge. So William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge were quite aspirants of poetry. They wanted to change the way poetry was seen, written and consumed. As I've already told you, they wanted poetry to be sensible and accessible to the common folk. They wanted any natural, any any day-to-day -day life person to read, appreciate and write poetry. This was a highly utopian or ideal dream way back in 1798. Because those who existed before these people had set high standards of high sophisticated uh, ecriture. So from that particular vantage point, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge had to rewrite the entire conceptualizations of poetry. It was not an easy task. So these two people, they decided to write poetry that are appealing to common folk. As a matter of fact, they also decided upon the subjects. William Wordsworth decided to write on natural elements. Samuel Taylor Coleridge decided or promised a vow to write on supernatural elements. I hope these two terms are familiar to you. Natural, whatever is around you. So you could see that while you read the initial volumes of lyrical ballads, you could see quite a lot of odd or intimo odds on uh, intimations and so on and so forth. So you would see quite a lot of uh, nature poems, nothing in UTTING if you haven't read it, it's a good poem, nothing by William Wordsworth. So there are quite a lot of poems that are related to nature. At the latter half of Wordsworth's career, you could see his angst and reservations towards the growing widespread rapid industrialization in England. So that transition also needs to be noted. Meanwhile, Samuel Taylor Coleridge focused on supernatural elements. You may all have heard of his popular unfinished masterpiece, Kublai Khan. An opium confessor's dream on the banks of Zanadu River. Kublai Khan is something that you may have heard of. It is regarded as his masterpiece, but the poem is incomplete because it was written as part of a high consumed opium effect. And once the effect dropped, the poem also dropped midway. Nonetheless, yeah, maybe you have it in image one as well. Yeah. So uh, these two people, they decided to write on two different subjects, natural and supernatural. And uh, in the first volume that came out in 1798, uh, William Wordsworth penned 19 poems based on these natural subjects. And Samuel Taylor Coleridge came up with four poems containing supernatural subjects. I hope the division is clear. 19 poems by William Wordsworth and four poems by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. So what is the image that's coming to your mind? Let's say if there is a book as big as this, 19 poems by William Wordsworth and four poems by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. It's not true. If this is the book, 19 poems by, sorry, four poems by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and 19 poems by William Wordsworth. Wordsworth po Wordsworth's poems were really short and Coleridge were too long. 
<laughs> so for those who joined late, let me just repeat a couple of crucial informations. Our second leg of MEG5 sessions have started today. This is the fifth session. Sixth session will be tomorrow, 5.30 to 7.30. And the seventh session will be on Friday. Thursday being Eid will be a holiday for us. On Friday, we'll have the seventh session. The remaining three sessions, hopefully, will be scheduled for the next week or the week after. So just letting you know, just in case you have joined late. And today we are discussing romantic criticism. And in order to do that, we started from where we left, neoclassical criticism. We discussed transition poets and their role in being the intermediary. And we have just about kick-started the romantic critical tradition. So I'll come back to romantic critical tradition because once we start romantic critical tradition, we are going to speak about that nonchalantly for the next one hour. Again, there is one more question I wanted to ask you. Or rather, I wanted to inform you. When we speak about romantic poets, we divide them into two. We divide them into first generation romantic poets and second generation romantic poets. Who are they? First generation romantic poets include Oh, no, 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 no. You have you just got it the other way around, PBG. It's the other way around. The first generation, it's based on the chronology. It's based on the hierarchy, the seniority. So who wrote first? Who wrote Lyrical Ballads? William yes, Wordsworth. Yes, I, I got it. Sir. Yeah, William Wordsworth. And uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. They are regarded as the first generation romantic poets. Sometimes their friend is also included in that link, in, the, in, the, in that list. His name is Robert Sade. These three are together called as lake poets as well, because they belong to the lake district. So Robert Sade, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and William Wordsworth. Once these people became slightly old, a new crop of writers emerged with new romantic sensibilities. And they became to be called as the second generation poets. They are Percy Bishay Shelley, John Keats, and Lord Byron. You may be familiar with these names from MEG1, but just in case you are not aware of, to be aware of this distinction would help. There is definitely a difference between you acknowledging William Wordsworth as a romantic poet, come critic, from acknowledging Wordsworth as a first generation romantic critic. So be aware of such subtle nuances in terms of terminology. We'll come back to the theoretical part in another couple of minutes because I have been speaking nonchalantly for a long time now. Well, I had played a video when we started the session today that was from old intimations of immorality, immortality, I'm sorry, immortality from William Wordsworth. Uh, this is the link. You may go back to and watch later. I also like to share another small video. This is a movie based on the relationship between Wordsworth and Coleridge. It's partly fictitious. Not everything is true in that. But still, as students of literature, you may find that interesting. Of course, we don't have time to play the entire movie. But then I would like to play a glimpse from that movie, wherein Coleridge recites one of his supernatural poems, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I think you have it in MEG1. All right, I hope that would have been quite an enthralling experience for you to listen to such a recital. And uh, let's quickly move on to the romantic criticism. So as I told you, the publication of lyrical ballads was a landmark in 
uh, kickstarting the romantic era and uh, the romantic era was marked not only by the poetry that formed particularly lyrical ballads but also the preface to lyrical ballads which was attached by William Wordsworth. As I told you, Lyrical Ballads was published in the year 1798. But the first edition, which contained 23 poems, 19 by Wordsworth and 4 by uh, Coleridge, did not have a preface. There were quite a lot of criticism, especially regarding the simple language used and the commonplace occurrences. That encouraged William Wordsworth to, encourage, uh, to, to include a preface in the second edition of Lyrical Ballads that came out in 1800. So the second edition of Lyrical Ballads contained a preface. It is in that preface that William Wordsworth defines poetry thus. How? What is Wordsworth's definition of poetry? So spontaneous overflow of emotions. In tranquility. Yeah. I don't know ah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, almost, almost right there. Anybody who knows it full? Those who have gone through the blocks, anybody? Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings and the emotions recollected in tranquility. Wow, amazing, Jasmindraji. Great. Now, I heard two people defining this. One was Preetiji. And then I suppose your name is Sashmita, Sashmita Bharaji. Let me just give you another backside story that you need to be aware of. Your definitions are act, it's precise, it's correct. But in 1800, in his preface, Wordsworth didn't po define poetry thus. In 1800, Wordsworth's definition of poetry was very simple. Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Full stop. In 1800, this is how Wordsworth defined poetry. This is spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. If you are a teacher in some school and if you have to teach punctuation to somebody, then this could be given as a prime example. Because two years later, in the next edition of Lyrical Ballads, in his preface, he edited this definition of poetry. How? He converted that full stop into a comma. And he wrote, recollected in tranquility. So in MEG 5, if and when you discuss Wordsworthian theory of poetry, this understanding would definitely be appreciated. There is definitely a difference between you quoting what he said in 1802 from you comparing and contrasting and saying why this transition came in between those two years. Okay, Again, as a digression for those who teach punctuations in schools, the most popular quotation that we use is, let's eat grandpa. So we say that if we put a comma, it becomes a, a sort of a request to the grandfather. Grandfather, come, let's eat. Otherwise, it becomes, come, let's eat our grandfather. So they say a comma can save your grandfather's life. Just in case you teach in schools, this is a comedy that most of the students enjoy. So uh, don't eat your grandpa, put a comma, eat with him. That's what we say. So similarly, um, William Wordsworth in 1800, due to his high idealism, imagine his intentions. What were his intentions? He wanted to make poetry common. He wanted to make it popular. He wanted to make, take it to the commoners. He wanted to make it accessible to everybody. He wanted to make a milkman or a gardener or a, a farmer think that he also can write poetry. So out of that idealistic outlook, William Wordsworth wrote, Poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It is a very simple, straightforward definition. 
I think the second definition may still need some sort of an explanation to you. The first definition does not need any explanation. You as an individual have some feelings and you are letting that feelings spontaneously overflow into a piece of paper and Wordsworth defines it as poetry. Poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. So what would have made him amend that definition two years later and recollected in tranquility means keep the spontaneous overflow on check. Don't write then itself. After a while think again when you are alone and then write. So what would have made William Wordsworth amend his definition thus? Again, just like Alexander Pope or uh, neoclassical writers, William Wordsworth by then had become quite an established writer. Even though he was against patronizing, he was the editor of quite a lot of magazines. So he received quite a lot of poems which were literally trash. Yes, we can problematize and uh, uh, try to distinguish between inborn talent, genius and such concepts. But then we, we must agree that trash is trash. So unfortunately, when he worked in the editorial board, he started receiving heaps and heaps of trash poet. And rejecting them, which is inevitable, involved risks for Wordsworth unlike anybody else. Because when Wordsworth rejects a poem, saying it is not good enough, people started asking back, you only said it is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. These are my spontaneous feelings in paper. So Wordsworth really became irritated or agitated. So in order to reduce his own burden and also to save the literary world from the danger that he had opened, he made this amendment in the third edition of Lyrical Ballads and said that it is ideal only when you recollect it in tranquility. Because when your mind is full of emotions, you may end up being biased. You cannot do justice to your thought. So let the feeling settle in. Like we say, let the dust settle in, settle down. So let the feeling settle down. Be calm, sit, sit alone, sit uh, in tranquility means sit alone and again ponder over your thoughts. Think twice, think thrice whether you should write this and then still if you think it is valid, put it down. This is the difference or this is the change or transition that Wordsworth's definition on poetry underwent. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this despite reading the blocks. So I took some time on that. Let me come back to this definition on poetry. Again, yeah, one more thing is I told you that Wordsworth served as an editor of so many uh, journals and he dismissed quite a lot of poems to the waste bin. So mostly Wordsworth's approach was to send that to the trash. He read a poem, he didn't like it, he put it in the trash. He liked it, he sent it for publishing. But then there was one poem or rather one poet whose entry enraged William Wordsworth to such an extent that instead of tearing that paper and putting it in the waste basket, Wordsworth wrote a letter back to that poet, a contemptuous letter stating, if you are a medical student, you rather pursue your profession rather than trying hand set arts like poetry, which is not your cup of tea. These are not the exact words, I'm just recreating the scenario. So William Wordsworth wrote back to a young poet, a young aspiring poet, calling his poems substandard. It of course affected the morale of that young poet, the budding poet deeply. But today, when we look back, we look at him as second only to William Shakespeare. He's a second generation romantic poet. You tell me who is he? 
I'm giving you umpteen clues. A young poet, a medical student who died young and he is second only to Shakespeare. Uh, Syed, I think you need to log out and log in again. If there is any issue with the volume, that should be a network issue. Yes, John Keats. So William Wordsworth wrote back to Keats calling him a substandard poet, advising him not to pursue poetry. He was highly demoralized because when a legend like Wordsworth says this, it's highly demoralizing. But we look back at Keats and regard him for his sensual poems. I'm sure you are aware of this after reading image you want. Sensual poems, you read Keats' odes, right? He has written quite a lot of odes. You read Keats' odes, you could smell it, you could see it, you could feel it, you could talk it. Yeah? So you could even touch it. So it's highly sensual, it's brimming. When he says a wine glass is brimming, you could visualize that wine glass overflow. That's how accurately or alluringly John Keats writes his poems. Okay, let's come back to William Wordsworth, inevitably. So William Wordsworth defines poetry in such a manner and his vision of poetry, as I've already told you, was to make poetry accessible, to make poetry commonplace. So him and Coleridge together joined hands in popularizing poetry. Now let's get into a few particulars. So they kick-started British Romanticism, Wordsworth and Coleridge replaced the 17th century fascination on analysis and reason with imagination and synthesis. Rather than nature or rules of decorum, the visionary imagination of the poet becomes the source of poetry for Wordsworth. The publication of Lyrical Ballads was a landmark event as I've already told you. It was motivated by a lot of things, including the French Revolution of 1789, publication of Confessions by Rousseau in 1781, which emphasizes on individual life as a matter worthy of art. Uh, these things kind of played a dominant role in popularizing uh, or in, in kickstarting romanticism. Okay. So William Wordsworth, as I told you, talks about natural poetry and he regards the ultimate end of mimesis is not to imitate or to improve nature. Whereas Coleridge was on the back of supernatural and he coins this term willing suspension of disbelief. Again, a critical terminology that you need to be aware of as students of literature. So what is willing suspension of disbelief? As consumers of art, we look at art as art. We know if we are watching a play for that sake, that it is an actor enacting a character. Say for instance, when Hamlet stabs Polonius in the Arras scene, in the screen scene, as spectators, we realize that it is the character Polonius who's been stabbed to death and the character who plays it is still alive. But still we express shock at the death of Polonius. In order to express such a shock, we have to do what Coleridge calls as willing suspension of disbelief. Just for the sake of it, if you want, you can go back and uh, try to have an analogical, uh, an analogy uh, between uh, Wordsworth's catharsis, sorry, uh, uh, Aristotle's catharsis and uh, Coleridge's willing suspension of his belief. Sorry. Yeah, uh, so that's something I would recommend just for the sake of the fun of it. Okay, so a new kind of mimesis wherein things take its ultimate shape, not from how things are, but how they are portrayed is at the heart of romantic literary composition. It is not about how things are, but how they are portrayed. They, dis they disregarded the rules of decorum by writing poems of ordinary subjects. 
Again, Beckram is a word that you are hearing from Plato. Plato, Aristotle, Longinus, Philip Sidney. So when we come to Romanticism, they entirely dis disregard the rules of Decker or the principles of Decker. And in their poems, they privilege the childlike wonder and naivety. They try to redefine the nature and status of poetry in an expressive way. You could see that in most of the, especially William Wordsworth's writings in particular. So poetry can be seen as a personal interaction within the individual and the world that surrounds the individual, as opposed to mimetic and pragmatic theories. Especially when we speak about Wordsworth, ode to intimations or immortality or nothing are all conversations that he has with himself and the outer world. It is not trying to imitate anything per se, but it is reflections of his own thoughts about his life, his predicament, his childhood experiences and what he sees around him. So such an attempt was done by, say for instance, William Wordsworth. Decker, as I've already told you, was disregarded and it was replaced with imagination. In terms of Wordsworth, you can observe that nature poetry of Wordsworth is the feelings and ideas excited as he contemplates nature. And that's where that spontaneous overflow dialogue comes from. Because the moment Wordsworth thinks of poetry, his feelings and ideas and experiences from nature excites him to write poetry. He talks about his childhood. He talks about his, uh, his uh, vision of nature. So that excites him and that makes him write poetry. So it is feelings that gives importance to action and not vice versa. Until then, especially in Aristotle, you could see that it is action which should give regard to feelings. But with Wordsworth, it is feelings that gives importance to action. It is the emphatic, unmediated life that Wordsworth sought to capture. This is in stark contrast to the court life in the 18th century. I have already remarked about that. The court life torn between the Whigs and Tories, full of satires and anonymous letters, which was highly artificial and out of touch with the wellsprings of humanity. Again, we know all these theorists in one way or the other draw from or disagree with the former theories. So with Wordsworth also, we can see that he agrees with both Aristotle and Sidney in that poetry is philosophical than history because it contains both specific facts and general truth. I repeat, poetry is philosophical than history because it contains both specific facts and general truth. Unlike history, poetry tries to engage in a philosophical discussion. And that is what makes poetry or poets responsible. Yeah, philosophical, philosophical as in, let's say. Sir, after that. Sorry? Sir, after philosophical. Poetry is philosophical than history. Oh, than history. Okay, sir. Than history, than history. Because it contains specific facts and general truths. So according to him, self-expression is not an end in itself, but a means to reach that which is permanent and eternal in pursuit of the permanent and eternal. He lays emphasis on self-expression, which again is based on personal experiences. Also, he sought to imitate the simple language of his rustic objects which most of the sophisticated previous poets have not done before. For instance, in his poems, you could see the babble of a child, for instance, which was considered inferior until then. So with Aristotle, you could see that such a self-expression uh, was attempted. He tried to imitate the simple language 
of the rustic subjects around him. He imitated the natural, less mannered style of the rustics. Rustic subjects, according to the romantics, are in touch with elementary passions and durable truth. Just as they tempered with their self-expression with a mimetic value, they tempered his use of rustic language as well. Wordsworth believed that a poet should not slavishly imitate rustic language, but through a process of selection, purge it of its grossness. Again, you may need a definition here or an example, an elaboration here. Uh, so let me make it very simple. Depicting the rustic as real, according to Wordsworth, would end up being gross. So to make the rustic presentable by slightly polishing it was the role of a poet. You cannot simply say blah, 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 like a child says, but rather make it more sensible. So maybe he would say, when the child says blah, 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 the child is uh, looking at nature and uh, invoking uh, the moon to come up, for instance. So that's the sort of a conception that Wordsworth had towards the uh, inclusion of rustic in language. The Romantics also redefined the idea of a poet. The question, what is a poem, became synonymous with who is a poet during the Romantic poet, a romantic, a romantic period. Unlike then, imagine, more often than not, the emphasis was on what was written. Especially during the neoclassical age, it was an era of anonymous writings. Even though people speculated who wrote this, they didn't really give a damn about who wrote it. It was the content that was prioritized. But with the Romantics, who was the poet became very significant. Just like you said right now, Preeti Ji. You could distinguish or demarcate between Wordsworth and Coleridge based on what poem you are reading. The moment you read something like Rama Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner or Kublai Khan, you will be sure that this is not Wordsworth. Even if there is a misprint for that sake. So such a demarcation was a deliberate establishment by the Romantic writers. The same can be said of the second generation writers, though they did not really purposively do that, unlike Wordsworth and Coleridge. When, when, you, when you read Keats, Shelley and Byron, you could see that they have their own different unique identities. You could distinguish between one and the other based on their language, their writing style and all. So that was a design feature of romantic literary uh, writing or romantic period. Then there is this popular, another popular definition by William Wordsworth in his preface. A poet is a man speaking to men. A poet is a man speaking to men, M-E-N. Right? So a man speaking to men. So there are quite a lot of things that comes into it, right? An individual speaking to several people. And again, a man speaking to so many men. And what would we what would they be talking? Definitely it's an adult talk. So they are talking about serious things that surrounds them, their feelings, what drives them, what leads them, what binds them. So the poet has lively sensibilities and is in touch with himself. He can feel absent pleasures as if they are present. So that's where imagination comes into existence. He can feel things that are absent. He can simply touch his soul and feel and reflect that in his writing. <clears throat> he rejoices in the pleasures of others and seeks to find it in the world. The romantic poet has a rich store of memory that he or she can tap into for poetic inspiration. 
again this is one of the principal claims of wordsworth the romantic poet has a rich store of memory in malayalam we say kalavar ormagalude oru kalavara shekaram thane romantic eluthukaadu kayil undu the romantic poets has a rich store of memory that he or she can tap into for poetic inspiration their childhood experiences their surroundings their imaginative capabilities and so on so he is a lover of his fellow men and honors the native naked dignity of man he does this by humanizing everything according to the human heart whereas the scientist seeks truth as an abstract entity the poet rejoices in the presence of truth as a visible companion so he looks into what is in front of him and he fills what is not there with imagination and rejoices in what he is gifted if science were to become so familiar an object that it would take flesh and blood then it would be the poet who could help transform it and humanize science to a kindred spirit wordsworth ascribes a new social role to the poet the massing of men into cities and the repetitive drudgery of their job produces in them an ignoble craving after extraordinary incident and a degrading thirst after outrageous stimulation he is speaking about the emerging industrialization scenario so poetry by enlarging refining sensibility has the power to rehumanize us poetry primarily exists to give pleasure through which it instructs and teaches again to teach to delight to instruct are three terms that we have been coming across from plato aristotle longinus and philipson so we could see wordsworth taking a different stance saying poetry is for pleasure poetry helps us to rehumanize ourselves amidst our hectic schedules amidst all the evils that surrounds us we read poetry and we become humans again we are born again we are awakened again the noble role of poet of art that we have discussed in our previous sessions as well so he says poetry exists to give pleasure if it doesn't give pleasure then that is not poet a direct attack on the sophisticated language that was used by the new classicists because anything that is sophisticated takes time talent and genius to appreciate not everybody can appreciate an extremely sophisticated writing why is keats so popular because keats writes in a simple language why do we find it difficult to read dryden or pope because of their sophisticated language why were metaphysical poets not popular because they wrote in an extremely sophisticated conceited language so as people who would like to appreciate simplicity we may very quickly rally behind william wordsworth or his vision of poetry yes still you may find his poems to be complex because we are not non native speakers of english that's not wordsworth's fault but because we are all indians we may still find wordsworth to be difficult in compared to several other poets including our indian poets for example one more word i forgot to define i'll add that before moving on to call rich this is pantheism pantheism means worship of nature so the romantics are bent on a pantheistic outlook so when you say lyrical ballads kick started romanticism the 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 vision of wordsworth is pantheistic in nature let me just add one more analogy before moving on to colrich and maybe opening the floor for final discussions because we have discussed wordsworth's theory of poetry and because we have discussed this claim that poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings 
it becomes my obligation to talk to you about Edgar Allan Poe. I think I have already done that in some of my previous sessions. I've spoken to you about him as a short story writer, as the father of detective fiction, as a um, dark romanticist poet, and so on. I'm not going to talk to you about any of that today. But when I talk to you about Edgar Allan Poe, well, just in, just give me a second, just in case you are feeling bored and need a small relaxation and recollect what we spoke about Edgar Allan Poe, allow me three minutes of digression. Let me just replay that video. It has nothing to do with the theory that we are discussing with, but just as a brief relief from my lecture and just to give my throat a couple of minutes of gap to get to fetch a little bit more water, I'll be right back. A high forehead topped by disheveled black hair, a sickly pallor, and a look of deep intelligence and deeper exhaustion in his dark, sunken eyes. Edgar Allan Poe's image is not just instantly recognizable, it's perfectly suited to his reputation, from the prisoner strapped under a descending pendulum blade to a raven who refuses to leave the narrator's chamber. Poe's macabre and innovative stories of Gothic horror have left a timeless mark on literature. But just what is it that makes Edgar Allan Poe one of the greatest American authors? After all, horror was a popular genre of the period with many practitioners. Yet Poe stood out thanks to his careful attention to form and style. As a literary critic, he identified two cardinal rules for the short story form. It must be short enough to read in one sitting, and every word must contribute to its purpose. By mastering these rules, Poe commands the reader's attention and rewards them with an intense and singular experience, what Poe called the unity of effect. Though often frightening, this effect goes far beyond fear. Poe's stories use violence and horror to explore the paradoxes and mysteries of love, grief, and guilt while resisting simple interpretations or clear moral messages. And while they often hint at supernatural elements, the true darkness they explore is the human mind and its propensity for self-destruction. In the telltale heart, a ghastly murder is juxtaposed with the killer's tender empathy towards the victim, a connection that soon returns to haunt him. The title character of Lysia returns from the dead through the corpse of her husband's second wife, or at least the opium-addicted narrator thinks she does. And when the protagonist of William Wilson violently confronts a man he believes has been following him, he might just be staring at his own image in a mirror. Through his pioneering use of unreliable narrators, Poe turns readers into active participants who must decide when a storyteller might be misinterpreting or even lying about the events they're relating. Although he's best known for his short horror stories, Poe was actually one of the most versatile and experimental writers of the 19th century. He invented the detective story as we know it, with The Murders in the Rue Morgue, followed by The Mystery of Marie Roger and The Purloined Letter. All three feature the original armchair detective, C. Auguste Dupin, who uses his genius and unusual powers of observation and deduction to solve crimes that baffle the police. Poe also wrote satires of social and literary trends and hoaxes that in some cases anticipated science fiction. Those included an account of a balloon voyage to the moon and a report of a dying patient put into a hypnotic trance so he could speak from the other side. Poe even wrote an adventure novel about a voyage to the South Pole and a treatise on astrophysics, all while he worked as an editor, producing hundreds of pages of book reviews and literary theory. An appreciation of Poe's career wouldn't be complete without his poetry, haunting and hypnotic. His best-known poems are songs of grief, or in his words, mournful and never-ending remembrance. The Raven, in which the speaker projects his grief onto a bird who merely repeats a single sound, made Poe famous. But despite his literary success, Poe lived in poverty throughout his career, and his personal life 
was often as dark as his writing. He was haunted by the loss of his mother and his wife, who both died of tuberculosis at the age of 24. Poe struggled with alcoholism and frequently antagonized other popular writers. Much of his fame came from posthumous and very loose adaptations of his work. And yet, if he could have known how much pleasure and inspiration his writing would bring to generations of readers and writers alike, perhaps it may have brought a smile to that famously brooding visage. Check out this playlist. All right, so my final emphasis before moving on to Coleridge is about the last part of that video. <clears throat> so the masterpiece of Edgar Allan Poe when it comes to poetry is Raven. Uh, you may have it in image one, if I remember correctly. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Edgar Allan Poe wrote Raven as a strong protest to William Wordsworth's theory on poetry. He didn't approve of poetry as a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. But rather, according to Edgar Allan Poe, poetry is a very highly concentrated effort. Yeah. So, uh, according to Edgar Allan Poe, an ideal poetry is the offspring of a genius, a hardworking talent. So, in order to prove that, Edgar Allan Poe, in a way, structured and created Raven. The dark setting, a lonely, lost lover, the bird coming and sitting in the bust palace, and the entire thing. He crafted it. And later, he explains this in his essay, The Philosophy of composition. If you have time, try to read it from Google, at least read the summary of it in the Google. In that, Poe contradicts William Wordsworth's theories and says that uh, poetry is not a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It requires quite a lot of effort, time and talent to have a proper setting and even the choice of words and uh, the division of stanzas, all these takes a lot of efforts. He, he dismisses William Wordsworth's uh, philosophy. And uh, in that regard, the philosophy of composition would come in handy to you. Of all the topics that is there in MEG5, whether I take the class or whether you read it on your own or whether you look at other videos, the romantic tradition is one area which you could simply walk in and maybe attempt an essay. The dates and the titles apart, of course, you would seldom forget Lyrical Ballad 1798. If you forget, just remember French Revolution. 1789, make that 8998. So 1798 Lyrical Ballads. So whatever William Wordsworth and Coleridge have said, you could simply write from your own mind. What is this? What is of love, of feelings? Uh, the role of the writer. Uh, poetry is for pleasure. You don't ne really need to learn by heart to say all these things. This is also our general conception of poetry. But then, when you write an essay, it would be ideal if you could bring in these analogies: first, uh, second edition, third edition, the differences in the definition, then what words word says, uh, how he brings it in his poems, then the contradicting opinions of Edgar and Poe, for instance, and again, how Coleridge lives a different path and so on. Okay, let me quickly move on to Coleridge. We are running short of time. So let me quickly move on to Coleridge. So at the heart of Coleridge's theory lays the distinction between two complementary type of thinkers, the natural philosopher and the transcendental philosopher. According to Coleridge, these thinkers go on complementary journeys at the successful completion of which it will end in a fusion of opposites. Natural philosophers from nature, that is object, to mind, the starting point in, his, sorry, the starting point is empirical observations. 
he takes an inductive approach basing his goals on general truths we have already said that wordsworth also had a similar line so they use an inductive approach based on general what is available uh, in front of them the perfect end of natural philosopher is with spiritualization of all the natural laws into the laws of intuitions and intellect the natural philosopher who does not complete his journey risks falling into the abyss of materialism in contrary or on contrary talking about the transcendental philosopher from transcendent in mind that is subject to nature that is object the starting point is an intuitive truth based on deduction the final end of a transcendental philosopher is incarnation of all the spiritual truths the transcendental philosopher who does not complete his journey risks falling into the abyss of idealism you could see shelly for that sake falling into that abyss of idealism so if they successfully complete their journey both these philosophers meet at the middle in a fusion between subject and object mind and nature universal and concrete coleridge calls the power of imagination that works as the force inducing such fusion as asymplastic imagination again it is a crucial term that you should be aware of they are not going to ask short notes or essays but as students of theory or literature it will be good if you have an idea of asymplastic imagination again let me just clarify that before proceeding further because hereafter we would move on to a few discussions on the terms coined by coleridge so before doing that let me just come back to this so there are two types of philosophers natural and transcendental and uh, generally theoreticians from plato to sidney or dryden uh, take one side but here coleridge says that both can exist co you know mutually they travel in their own parallel paths which would combine at some point and they would have a different sort of realization when he says that when they meet there is a fusion between subject and object nature and mind universal and concrete so in order to force such a reality you need imagination which he calls as asymplastic asymplastic imagination the next major concept this is something that also comes as a short note so we need to spend some time here so next distinction that coleridge brings forth is between imagination and fancy again as opposed to other thinkers who use it synonymously until then imagination and fancy were used as synonymic as in one that could replace the other but coleridge distinguishes between the two he says that imagination is something and fancy is the other thing they cannot be used synonymously so he calls fancy as a limited power capable of only shifting the existing images around and he prioritizes or hierarchies imagination as a higher power capable of effecting higher fusions it fancy as a limited power which can only which is only capable of shifting the existing images around and imagination as a higher power capable of effecting higher fusions again you could see a minor contradiction if you look at that because these are people who are against any sort of rigid classifications or sophistications or hierarchy use of hierarchy but despite that you could see coleridge in a way rallying up imagination ahead of fancy but he has a point it is a factual observation he tries to promote imagination ahead of fancy and then he speaks about two types of imagination or twin powers of imagination he says the power to perceive similitude lurking within dissimilitude that is the power to find connections in a chaotic poetic universe is the power of imagination and the second one is the synthetic power to effect fusion of opposites 
like we already mentioned, to synthesize two opposites into one is something that only imagination can do. Again, he distinguishes imagination as primary and secondary. Primary imagination occurs when our subjective individual consciousness is passively inspired by the ultimate self-consciousness of God. I repeat, primary imagination occurs when our subjective individual consciousness is passively inspired by the ultimate self-consciousness. For example, the artists who are passively inspired by God or any other external factor. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the role of secondary imagination is to dissolve, dissipate and diffuse in order to recreate. Poetry as a living organism wherein the parts are contained in the whole and essence of the whole is contained in the parts is projected by Coleridge. Just like Wordsworth, he says that poetry should give equal pleasure from both the parts and the whole. A symbiotic dynamic relationship exists between the part and the whole. You cannot look at any one aspect and disregard the other. Both combine to form a cumulative effect according to Samuel Taylor Coleridge. That somewhat brings us to a close on the discussion between Wordsworth and Coleridge's discussions. Let me just see if I missed anything. I have shared those couple of links with you. Yes, I would also like to share this lecture with you, which is also quite informative and uh, detailed when it comes to their theoretical conceptualizations. You may go and have a look at it. It is by Jonathan Bait. He quite elaborately discusses or explains why lyrical ballads is one of the landmark and influential volumes of poetry ever written. Also, yeah, a couple of links more. Just give me a couple of minutes and I'll leave the floor open. Um, I would also like to share two more links with you. And this is optional. This is not compulsory. This is his own talk on the origins of romanticism. I have already touched that, the factors leading to it. But this is an elaborate lecture on the origins of romanticism. <clears throat> also, I would like to share this talk by James Chandler on the role of Wordsworth and Coleridge in poetry. More than MEG5, this would come in handy for your MEG1. Also, I'd like to share this brief, rather old documentary on William Wordsworth, just in case you are interested in those times and his personal life and affairs, this link could come in handy for your further referrals. Also, a word on the four poems written by Coleridge in volume one of Preface. I told you it was a 1904 uh, distinction, <clears throat> especially for UGC net exam in particular. There are questions asked regarding the uh, four poems by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The Foster Mother's Tale is the first one. Then the Dungeon, the Nightingale, and the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. We have heard from the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner in today's class. The other three are The Foster Mother's Tale, The Dungeon, and The Nightingale. Do not confuse that with Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. It's an entirely different one.
All right. I hope that somewhat sums up our discussions on Wordsworth and Coleridge. I couldn't discuss Percy Bysshe Shelley's defense of poetry today, but then maybe uh, you could read it from the blogs. It's comparatively less significant apart from his conceptions of, uh, you know, again, defense of poetry is what happens. Defense of poets is what happens. So um, apart from that, there is nothing, again, yeah, there's nothing much that needs to be detailed regarding Shelley. But had we had time, I could have just run through his conceptions. Nonetheless, we have 10 to 15 minutes. If you have any questions, the floor is open for questions. So one technique that I suggest to all my students, first of all, is make a list of all the poems that you have for study. That comes for annotations in particular. Make a list. And how do you learn these poems? There is no point in reading your blogs. There is no point in reading Google Spark Notes and other stuff. That's all the last stage or the second last stage. First of all, when you are in kitchen, when you are traveling, when you get free time, you would be doing now, you would be listening to YouTube, you would be listening to songs, you would be listening to news channels, right? So just like that, make a habit of listening to these poems. Most of these poems have YouTube renditions. So just play it five minutes, 10 minutes, some would be two minutes, some would be 20 minutes. So while you're in the kitchen, while you're having your dinner, lunch, whatever, while you're traveling, just play this on and listen to those audios. You may not understand a single word sometimes. You may find it really boring. But you know what happens? Because let's say in two months, you would have heard it at least three times. When say, for instance, an annotation comes, shut, shut the door, good John, fatigued, I said. You would be like, hey, ye toh kahi suna hai, kahi suna hai. Shut, shut the door, fatigued, I said. Ha, huh, Alexander Pope, epistle to Arbat note. What did he say? Yeah. Shut the door, good John, fatigued, I said. Tie up the locker. Nee, locker nee. Kya tha? Tie up the knocker. Say I'm sick, I'm dead. So you would remember the next line as well. And when it comes to annotations, if you can remember the previous line and the next line and identify the context, that does a lot of difference to your marks. Rather than summarizing those two or three or four lines, if you can remember and recollect the previous and the preceding and the you know succeeding lines, that makes a lot of difference. So when you listen to those songs, that will help you a lot. That will give you a mileage. So listen to the poems from YouTube or podcasts are available where you could listen to. Uh, I don't know if Shivangi is attending here today. Shivangi herself does a quite a lot of podcasts and a lot of uh, apps. And she gets money from that as well. She's established now. So these are certain things that, <laughs> see, my favorite songs are more like a time pass, a mind relaxing process. But listening to poems would actually help you remember those poems. If I can recollect certain poems, that's not only because some teachers have taught those poems good to me, well to me, but also because I listen to those poems at times. I could recollect this poem, The Wind Howl by, G, by G. M. Hopkins. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Mere anarchy is loosened upon the world. Things fall apart. Why do I remember that? Yes, because my teacher was so dramatic in uh, teaching this poem. But also because I have listened to that several times. Because I like that lines. So when we listen to that again and again, that is there in our minds. Maybe we'll get the punctuation wrong. We'll get the spelling wrong. But we know the lines. And somewhere we also know the arrangement. So that's something that would help when it comes to MEG1 exams. So that is a simple suggestion. When you get free time, when you want to sleep for that sake. Listen to some random poem and sleep. Every day. And wake up with a random poem. It would do quite a lot of good to your MEG1 prospects. So that's one suggestion that I have for you, Prithiji. And I hope that helps. And simultaneously, simultaneously once you have identified the poems, you can go and Google it, go wiki it, go spark note it and go EPG part shall it or whatever you want or even go to the blogs for that sake. Sir, excuse me, sir. How many yes, sir, words? Yes, sir. Tell me. Minimum of how many words will suffice for a 20 mark answer? Depends on what paper it is, Sayyid Zain Ali. It, it again differs from one paper to another. 
they would have stated that and now that they have only one booklet and they don't give you the additional number of booklets they instantly state in the question itself 300 words 500 words 600 words they have it bracketed so don't worry and i keep no, saying also, the word limit actually does not have too much of a role in giving marks what matters is how well you have answered the question for instance they ask about the puritan influence in um, what is the name of the poem by milton um, i forget that dryden no no john milton it allegro and pen uh, no, 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 no. no 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 the other one the other one that's prescribed for your study satan paradise lost okay paradise lost and paradise regained so suppose you have a question uh, what is the puritanical influence in paradise lost by john milton and you end up writing the summary of the poem no matter you write 10 pages you are not even going to get five marks because you have not answered the question the question is about the religious influence that has led to the writing of the poem so apart from length what matters is how far you have understood the question how have you answered that question say for instance uh, a question like uh, um, a novel let's i'm just giving a random name let's say uh, the stranger by uh, john sartre as an absurdist novel and instead of addressing the concept of absurdity if you are writing the summary of that novel you're not going to get marks or let's say uh, way of the world as a comedy of manners tragic the comedy comedy of manners drama and you try to write the summary of the way of the world then you don't address the comedy of manners genre then you don't get marks okay i'm just reading the messages thank you for your kind words thank you anukya samparna then yeah thank you mamta devi waiting for gotu <laughs> yes thank you yeah so thank you i hope i answered you so uh, i have one question yes please go on so, to answer uh, like there are uh, it's regarding mg1 only <laughs> so there oh. biblical uh, sorry biblical See, uh, let, uh, let, literally let me tell you yeah i'll take your question literally let me tell you i am teaching you mg5 okay please bear that in mind literary criticism and theory is what i am teaching and because i have quite a lot of poets like philip sidney and william wordsworth i have to draw analogy from their poems so please don't confuse and believe that i am teaching mg1 all right go on i don't mind answering them though if i know it yes go on to the <laughs> So actually, I was asking that there are many biblical allusions, or uh, or some uh, like some uh, Christian just, concept yeah. associated with yeah. the poems, and because mm -hmm. we are unaware, and now like uh, I know the summary, I know its thematic uh, and uh, everything else, but I don't know those biblical allusions. So is it mm -hmm. uh, mandatory to like stick on those, and then I mean because time is so short, so now I am very much confused what to do. again again it is context specific it is about which work are you talking about like for instance yeah, if you are talking about uh, paradise suppose yeah. i am talking about the garden by andrew marvels hmm. marvels sorry it is, it, it, so, it matters because it it is connected to the poem right again the pulley the pulley by the other bit of the by herbert sir yeah herbert william i mean herbert uh, not william herbert the other herbert uh, it, is, it, is, it is it is also a christian religious uh, flavor to it so if you don't know the background you can't answer that completely so in that case you have to read the allusions properly yeah george herbert sir so you have to read the allusions properly there are some writers who who call for that religious background t s eliot for that sake if you don't know the christian zeal that t s eliot was inspired by you cannot interpret his poems of a classic murder in the cathedral it was written for a christian play festival just in case you don't know that in 1935 so 1935 yeah that was the year in which murder in the cathedral was written if i remember correctly yes sir yeah it was for the canterbury uh, festival which was a biblical festival uh, oh 1170 sir 
on 29th December, uh, this uh, Archbishop was killed. Yeah, I'm talking about the play. The play was written by Elliot for the purpose of that biblical stage. So if you are not aware of that, then that becomes difficult. But then unfortunately, we don't have a choice. I had the same feeling, though it may appear to be biased or blasphemous. I always felt that my Christian compatriots or my Christian classmates had an edge over me when I read through certain phases because I was totally clueless. Certain terminologies, certain even the religious terminologies like Presbyterians, Jacobites, and uh, uh, Catholics. I was not sure about what was what and who was who. So when somebody says Alexander Pope was a Catholic, for me it was like Ganta. What difference does it make? Then I came to realize that Catholics were a minority in England and they had to undergo a lot of uh, repression and suppression and then that became difficult. So we have to read through that as well. Again with Hamlet, why does Hamlet doesn't commit suicide? Because it's against the biblical uh, concepts or notion of Ten Commandments. You can't commit suicide. You can't kill someone while he's praying. So as a normal reader, I would not understand that. Only by a basic understanding of the Bible can I interpret these things in the queue. Okay. So thank, thank you all. You so thank you for your kind thank words. You also spread the words. Also spread the word with your friends that the classes are back. Ask them to join tomorrow. We'll have a lot more fruitful session tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.